Indeed, the echo of God's gospel call are truly beautiful, and they are truly wonderful words of life. To our guests who are joining us tonight, we hope and pray that you have been willing to share your contact information with us. We'd like to, for you, if you don't mind, to stick around a few minutes afterward uh, to be able to know one another, to continue to fellowship and to build and strengthen that bond of friendship that we seek to aim, aim to establish with you. To our brethren as well, we thank you for returning tonight. And for those who were unable to join us this morning, thank you for being here tonight to worship our God in spirit and in truth. Please open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, the 16th chapter. Now our thought this evening's, our thoughts, excuse me, this evening's will be, this evening will be coming from verse 7. Proverbs 16, verse 7. <clears throat> when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Please bow with me in prayer. Our precious Father and our heavenly God, hallowed be thy name. Thank you, Father, and again for another opportunity that we have on this first day of the week. Father, to begin this week, Father, with praise and glory and worship to thee. For giving us this blessing, Father, where we as thy church and as thy saints may come to the assembly, Father, and assemble with one another to be assembled together by thy holy word, Father, to be able to grow, Father, and to stir one another up into love and good works. And as we take, Father, the life of this King, Father, whom you put upon David's throne, that, Father, we may take it as an admonishment as thy, as thy scripture teaches us, that we, Father, may take these life lessons to heart, and that, Father, we may learn of how, Father, he put measures into place to perpetuate that peace that your servant David had uh, secured for him as a king. Father, that we too may learn from this to perpetuate the peace that our king, your son Jesus, has, a, has secured for us in our lives through the gospel, Father, which we are grateful for. Forgive us, Father, for our sins. Forgive us for the wrongs, Father, and forgive us when we have transgressed thy law or when we have, Father, offended our brother or sister. Allow us, Father, the opportunity to make it right, but grant us the humility and the meekness so that we, Father, may strive to always, Father, do what is pleasing in thy sight. We thank you, Father, once again for these blessings, and we pray this in the glorious and mighty name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Indeed, this proverb, which was written by King Solomon, was coming from personal experience. We know that in the 40 years that Solomon reigned as king of Israel while he sat on the throne of David, the Bible teaches us that there was peace surrounding Solomon all around him. His enemies did not decide to attack, but rather Solomon was able to make treaties with them. We're able to see that inside, Solomon was also able to receive a kingdom where there was no civil war brewing. There was no internal struggle, as far as we know, that was threatening enough to remove the crown off of Solomon's brow. But instead, we see that the Bible teaches us there in 1 Kings chapter 4, that peace surrounded Solomon, and his name, without a doubt, was making a presence during his reign. Remember that the, wind, that the name of Solomon refers or is uh, referencing to peace, the peaceful one, if I'm not mistaken as to what the interpretation is. But indeed, brethren, we see and we know that Solomon's peaceful kingdom was an inheritance that he received. We know that David was the one who fought the bloody wars. We know that his father was the one who was able to etch this peace by being a peacemaker, whereas Solomon's responsibility was to be a keeper of that peace that his father had forged for him. But notice what we are reading here in Proverbs chapter 16, the first part of verse 7. In order for this to happen, in order for this peace to be perpetuated, we must make choices that please our Lord as far as how we go about keeping this peace. 
We have to make choices that our God is in agreement with because in the end, it is he who says the Bible will even make our enemies to be at peace with us. You see, as long as we are making choice that ple choices that make our God pleased with us, as long as we are placing people around us that are approved by our God, as long as we are making choices where it puts Him at the front and center of our lives, the promise that is being made by this proverb is that our God will be the one to extend, which is a synonym of perpetuating that peace. He will allow it to be long-lasting. He will allow it to be one in our lifetime where we can enjoy, as Solomon did, a reign of peace where blood was not shed. You know, as I was studying this and I was looking at this, it's interesting to know that it, was, it is very likely that this was the only time where Israel enjoyed 40 years of peace. 40 years where not a single battle was fought. 40 years where their enemies did not choose to go and to try to conquer them because they were too weak and were not strong enough to present a threat or a danger to Solomon. For 40 years, the kingdom of Solomon not only reveled in peace, but because of the peace that they had, prosperity came hand in hand with it. And all of this, brethren by one wise selection that Solomon made. The choice that he made which pleased the Lord. The choice of asking for more wisdom so that he could be able to govern God's chosen people in righteousness and with meekness and submission to him as king. When we go back to 1 Kings chapter 4, there we see how Solomon was able to begin to perpetuate the peace that he had seen his father secure for him. You see, we've already read in chapter 3, verses 16 through 28, how Solomon, using wisdom, was able to make a righteous choice and was able to see even deeper of what in actuality was going on. And I truly believe that this case is shown to us as a portrait of the kind of king that was sitting on the throne of David. The type of ruler that Solomon was, at least at the beginning of his reign. The type of righteous ruler who actually cared about doing what was right for the kingdom and not necessarily simply for his own pocketbook. When we go into chapter 4, observe what, king, what, what Israel was able to enjoy from their king while he was on the throne. In verses 1 through 19, we see a list of names. And what we learn here is that David, or excuse me, that Solomon, if you will, as a way of understanding, chose his cabinet very wisely. He knew that he needed help. He knew that he needed to choose men that he could trust. But he did not only choose men that he could trust, but he chose men who were qualified for this position. He distributed them according to their strengths. This shows us, brethren, that the men that Solomon chose were men that he knew. There were men that he was aware of, either because they at one time served his father. Notice some of the names and pay attention to the very first thing that Solomon focuses on, which is where the proverb, com proverb comes in. Verse 2, And these were, his off these were his officials, Azariah the son of Zadok the priest, Eliareth and Abijah the sons of Shisha, scribes, Jehoshaphat the son of Eliud the recorder. Now pay attention to the first two verses in verse 2 and verse 3. What Solomon prioritized when he began to choose his officials was that the first thing that needed to be in order, the first thing that needed to be set, because it was the most important, was not those who were going to distribute the wealth, was not those that were going to take care of the social laws. Pay attention. Solomon prioritized the religious aspect of his government first. He secured the priesthood first. He placed on that position as an official Azariah the son of Zadok, the priest. Zadok was the priest who, along with Nathan, backed Solomon as king and not Adonijah back in chapter 1. 
You see, Solomon chose a man whom he knew was a holy and righteous man. And he chose a son from this man because he trusted that this priest had not only taught his son through example, but he had trained him well in the laws of the temple that God had given them. Now remember, Solomon has in mind that he's about to build a temple because his son, his father David, had passed this on to him. So Solomon has in his mind the idea and he has understanding that he needed to place the priesthood and he needed to make sure that the religious leaders of Israel were set and prepared so that once the temple was opened, once the temple was completed, they would not find themselves scrambling for Levite priests who could serve in the temple when needed. He prioritized the religious. He prioritized the spiritual. Notice that in this kingdom that was approved by God, there is no separation of church and state. But instead, we see that one amplifies the other. Because based on those ideals and based on that understanding, then Solomon in verse 4 turns his attention to the country's defenses. He turns to Benaniah, the son of Jehodiah, who would then replace Joab as the captain of his guard. He now had a new general, the same man who killed Joab, the same man who once more backed Solomon as king of Israel, a man who had proven his loyalty to him, a man who had proven to him that he too respected God's words and God's decisions when it came to the throne of David. But in verses 1 through 19, we see that all of these people that Solomon chose, there were people that were qualified. There was no nepotism in this list. There was no one that was chosen based on friendship or based on some kind of favor that he needed to pay up. Each and every one of these people that he chose were chosen because they were the right man for the job. They were chosen because Solomon in his wisdom and under the gaze of wisdom could see that they could unfold this responsibility righteously and effectively. The reality is that he was not wrong. The reality is that Solomon did not, have, did not make the wrong choice. We're going to go get ahead a little bit of ourselves. Go to verse 24, chapter 4, verse 24. For he had dominion over all the region on the side of the river, from Tibsha even to Gaza, namely over all the kings on the side of the river. And he had peace on every side all around him. He did not choose wrong. The men that he put on, on, that he put in charge of the people, according to the tribes. Remember, when Solomon is king, the twelve tribes are still united. So think of it as a way of a, of a connection or as a way of understanding what's happening here. Think of them with these following words: Solomon was a king over the twelve United States of Israel. These 12 tribes were, if you will, states that he was placed over. And he needed to govern them. He needed to rule them. The king would have been our equivalent of the federal government. And thus these men that he placed over them in their positions, they were, if you will, state governors. Now I know that this is not exactly right. That's why I said is a way of an idea to be able to correlate. But the point is that Solomon was not just ruling over Judah. He was not just ruling over Jerusalem. He was ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. Add to the fact that this was not just any nation. This was God's chosen people. This was a heavy responsibility. Notice what Solomon does different from Moses after he brought them out of Egypt. Solomon knew he needed help. And therefore he put men in positions that he can trust. Not only that they wouldn't betray him, but more importantly, he put people that he could trust could do their jobs righteously. People who were actually going to do what they were assigned. Men that were reliable. Men who could do the job that they were assigned. Men that would not gripe nor murmur, but rather find a way to do what they were being tasked to do. 
You see, brethren, we have to learn from this. We understand that we have those patterns in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and First Timothy chapter 3, verses 1, all the way to verse uh, uh, 13, where we see that in there, in Timothy, we see the offices of deacon and the office of, pre, of, of elder. In Titus 1, 5 through 9, we see the office of elder. But then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we see where the evangelist is being mentioned here. And we see that in these three offices, God is giving us requirements of what we wisely should look for because these are going to be men that are going to be placed in positions with the intent of pursuing peace, perpetuating peace. You see, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, we are told that we have to guard the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. God has already given us peace through His Son. And because we as the church are united in the blood of Christ, because we are one body and we are one kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, then we have that responsibility to extend that peace as much as we can. The Bible tells us as it pertains to you, live peaceably with all men. One way of doing that, as we see here in 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 19, is by putting the right people in the right positions that they can be successful. We have to put the right men and women in the classrooms who would teach the children, who would teach the young people. Men and women who desire to do so, but will do so with all of their effort. We have to put greeters, which we will be doing so very soon here. Men and women who will actually be very friendly to our guests, who will actually be able to receive them, and they will do it to the best of their ability. You see, what we learn from this passage here is that when we place the right people in the right positions, because we see in them that they have the tools and the ability to do so effectively, we extend our peace. And with it, Verse 20 and forward of 1 Kings chapter 4, prosperity follows. Let me read to you very quickly, very, very quickly there in verse 20 and forward. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse, verse 20 and forward. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. So Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines, as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Now Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour, 60 cores of meal, 10 fatted oxen, 20 oxen from the pastures, and 100 sheep, besides deers, gazelles, roebucks, and fatted fowl. For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, from Tipsa even to Gaza. Namely, over all the kings on this side of the river, and he had peace on every side all around him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And these governors, each man in his month, provided food for King Solomon and for all who came to King Solomon's table. There was no lack in their supply. See, brethren, when we perpetuate peace, when we take advantage and we actually use it wisely, and we make sure that we grow it to where we want to keep it because we see how wonderful it is to live in that type of time, Prosperity will follow. And it is not one-sided. Pay attention to the fact that all of Judah and Israel lived and dwelt, says Scripture, in safety. They dwelt safely. They were never afraid that band, uh, bands of raiders would come to steal their food as we read in the book of Judges. Pay attention to the fact that at all, not only that, the prosperity was felt in all of the kingdom. The Bible says that each man under, uh, sat under his vine and his fig tree. They had possessions of lands. And their lands were fertile. And they didn't have to steal from their neighbor's vine or from their neighbor's fig tree because every man had his own. 
they as a kingdom were enjoying the prosperity. Because Solomon perpetuated that peace. He took advantage of it. He used it while he had it. And he used it to grow and strengthen the country as a whole. Brethren, Solomon was looking toward the future. Solomon was trying to secure that peace for his children, and very likely for his children's children, just as his father has secured that peace for him and for Rehoboam. And thus Solomon understood that while they had this peace, while they had this unprecedented event happening in their lifetime, it was the time to take advantage of it and use it and build it up. He did not lose or waste time letting it go. Not at the beginning of his reign. At the beginning of his reign, he grew it. He multiplied it. And in doing so, he made sure that everyone in Israel was appeased and everyone was happy and satisfied with what was going on. You see, in the first 20 verses of the first 19 verses, we see how Solomon took, out, took care of the people. And by doing so, these people, these men who were righteously dividing things up to them, kept the peace among the people. And it quelled any ideas or thoughts of rebellion or civil war. Who would want to get rid of a king who was making them rich? Who would want to get rid of a king who had stopped their enemies from attacking them? Who would want to get rid of a king who actually cared about them because he personally chose the men that would be overseeing them, who would be fair and righteous just as he was? Now, let me bring you back a little bit. Remember that the book of Kings is a retrospect book. If you will, it's a type of anthology. Well, Brother Obed, it's Sunday evening. You shouldn't be using those words yet. Well, what does that mean? It means that the writer who was inspired, he is writing all of this from the present looking back in the past. The writer of the first book of Kings is unknown. But it is well documented and it is agreed by most biblical scholars, most biblical erudites, that the book of Kings, the first and second book of Kings, were very likely written or during the Babylonian captivity or after they returned home from the Babylonian captivity. Most agree that it was Jeremiah himself who wrote these two books. Do you now see why that's important as we're reading this? What was the state of Judah when they returned home from Babylon? They had not seen peace and they had not felt peace in over 70 years. They were slaves in a foreign country. And then during that turmoil, Babylon was then conquered by the Mede-Persians. All they saw around them was that their enemies, who once used to be subdued by them, had grown much stronger and much more powerful than they were, so much so that Judah wasn't really even considered a threat by any of them. Long were gone the days of prosperity of Israel. Because the wisdom was squandered away. Because the rulers, whether it was over a tribe, over a province, or the king sitting on the throne himself, became greedy and selfish. And as we read in Proverbs 16, 7, the opposite happened. The choices they made did not please God. The people they chose to rule over them 
did not please God. In Ezekiel chapter 34, we see where God speaks to the shepherds of Israel. And we see where God declares how they had made themselves into wolves who were taking advantage of the sheep of Israel. To each his own was the mentality of Israel or Judah before Babylon arrived and God used them as his sword of punishment. Can you imagine if it was indeed the weeping prophet, as they say so, who wrote these words? How difficult it must have been for him to be revealed by the Holy Spirit and to see as we would say in our vernacular, the golden age of Israel, a time of prosperity, a time of joy, a time of safety, a time of certainty because the hand at the helm was a sturdy one. And the one manning the ship knew what he was actually doing. Notice, brethren, how as we read here in First Kings chapter 4, Solomon was wise enough to distribute, and everyone was enjoying the prosperity. He took advantage of that prosperity, and he multiplied it. Because Solomon wasn't only thinking about his era, he was thinking ahead in the future. He was thinking about the generations to come. Because again, his goal was to perpetuate the peace that he was enjoying during his reign. Brethren, when we find ourselves in a momentum where everyone wants to work, when we find in ourselves in a momentum where we are filled and blessed with children and young people who want to work, when we find in ourselves where we have strength and knowledge, seasoned experience together, we should take advantage of it. We should th take advantage of it looking into the future when we're no longer here. We need to do as Solomon did and perpetuate that blessing, perpetuate that growth, perpetuate that peace so that it could extend as long as possible while we are here. Because too many congregations are dying away because of short-sighted leadership. Too many congregations have become victims of not looking into the future with wisdom from above. You see, in a time of prosperity, yes, we can enjoy that blessing. But the wise thing to do is to use it so that we can multiply it, so that we can extend it. It's very selfish when we only think about the fact that, well, I'm not going to be alive then, so it won't matter because I'm not even going to know what's going to happen. That's a very unwise and very selfish thought. Solomon didn't think that way. And it pleased God. It pleased God that Solomon was ruling in that manner. It pleased God that Solomon had this in his mind. It pleased God that Solomon was wanting for his people to be in good standing with God for as long as possible, even when he was no longer around. Finally, brethren, notice verse 34, in chapter 4, verse 34. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who heard of the wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. You see, Solomon perpetuated the peace by using his influence for good. Solomon was using his influence so that he can influence those kingdoms around him to serve the God of heaven. Go with me to chapter 5. Go with me to chapter 5. And read as an example and as proof of what we are saying. As a way of a, of a recap, because we don't have enough time, 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, Solomon 
writes a letter, sends it to the king of Tyre, asking him for for him to continue to be in that treaty and in that friendship that he and his and his father had once shared. But not only that, he asks for that king's permission to be able to receive not only workers, but also material from his kingdom so that he can build the temple that God had, had been promised by David would be built by Solomon's hand. Notice the response, verse 7, of Hiram and how Solomon's wise influence brought forth this foreign king to a very important acknowledgement. First, First Kings chapter 5, verse 7, So it was when Hiram heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, for he has given David a wise son over this great people. Now remember, Hiram is a foreign king. He's from Tyre. But pay attention, whom is he blessing? And which kingdom is he rejoicing over? His great joy came from the fact that Israel still had a right, righteous and good king. And he's acknowledging that it is God who has placed Solomon over that throne. Solomon's wise fame, Solomon's influence, made a foreign king acknowledge that the Lord God, he is God. Daniel did the same thing. In Daniel chapter 4, when he warned Nebuchadnezzar about his arrogance getting the best of him, Nebuchadnezzar himself writes by his own words, and he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, recognize that the God of Daniel, he is God. Pharaoh, when Joseph interpreted his dream, also recognized that in Joseph, the Spirit of God dwelt. For there is no other man like him. Genesis chapter 39, verse 19. You see, Solomon perpetuated the peace by extending it to other kingdoms and influencing them to also establish their plans in God's ways. Solomon was leading the charge. Solomon was leading the nations around him and he was teaching them the value of fearing God and keeping his commandments. You see, if you go with me to Deuteronomy very, very quickly, Deuteronomy... The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 6, 7, and 8. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what, is, what, for what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are, all, as are in all this law, which I said before you this day? Why was Solomon's wisdom so famous? Why were there kings from the east coming to see him? Why was the queen of Sheba come to see him? Why were they all coming to consult him and to hear of his wisdom? Because Solomon was following the commandments, the statutes, and the ordinances of the Lord God, who is God. Brethren, think about us as Christians. When we abide by the law of God, when we follow the law of Christ, when we do things biblically and we stick to the book and the only book that should rule our lives, how many times do you have co-workers or neighbors or friends come looking for advice from you? Because they don't know what to do with their situation. How many times do those people come seeking you out because it is a moral conundrum and they don't know what to do? I don't know what to do. I know you go to church. I know that you follow the Bible. Or as I actually heard one time, I know that you are a holy man. My jeans had holes in them, so I did wonder if that's what they refer to. But why? 
Why would that person believe that I had advice that was worth listening to? And why did they trust that that advice could help solve the problem? Because it's not my wisdom. The wisdom comes from God. And that wisdom is what's solving the problem. I'm just the voice that God is using to transmit the message. Hiram, king of Tyre, acknowledged that the God of Israel had placed Solomon on that throne. And all those kings and all those people, even the queen of the south, she acknowledged in 1 Kings chapter 10, she gave God glory and she thanked him for giving Solomon the wisdom that he had. How are we using our influence with the world around us? How are we using our influence at school, at work, the grocery stores, the clinics, the hospitals, the sporting events? How are we using our influence? Can they see God's wisdom in us? Do they trust that we can give them wise counsel straight from God's word? You see, brethren, we too have the king of peace himself as our ruler. And as we established this morning, he is greater than Solomon. So much so that in Philippians chapter 4, the Bible tells us that the peace that God gives us when we rely on him surpasses all understanding. And when the world who does not know God sees that peace in us that they cannot understand, there is only one answer that makes sense. They must serve God and the only God who created heaven and earth. But if we're living as fools claiming to be wise, our actions will reveal us to be frauds, won't it? You see, Solomon's actions and how he perpetuated peace, how he extended it, how he built upon it, and how he braced it was what led other kingdoms to want to be like him. It's what prompted them to pay attention to what was happening in Israel and to start inquiring, well, what is he doing different and why are they prospering? The equivalent today would be, what is that congregation doing so that it can grow the way that it's growing? How are they doing it? What are they doing? And if it's biblical, how do we replicate it here? We must understand, brethren, to, to perpetuate peace. We must, like Solomon, put our plans in the hands of God because they must please him. If they don't please God, if they are not approved by God, our enemies will not be held at peace by him. But instead, we will be making an enemy of God himself. Like Solomon, at least in the beginning of his reign, we have to be sure that the priority is always the spiritual. We have to start from the inside out. And that's how we secure a strong, wholly successful future for our children and our children's children. Perhaps tonight you are among us and you have not yet put on Christ in baptism. You are at war with God through your sin. You are at war with yourself because you are here and you want to do what's right, but your flesh is telling you that you want to continue to live in sin. You want to find a way where you can find, quote, a loophole in Scripture. But that's an unwise thought. You see, God is telling you there is no loophole because he's perfect and his law is perfect. But there is a solution to your sin problem. God can put that war in your members to rest. And he can, he can quench the war between you and him tonight if you simply make the wise choice of submitting yourself to the King of Peace, Christ Jesus, by obeying his commandment. And that commandment is to be baptized, that is, to be immersed in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins. But it also is that when you rise out of those waters of baptism, 
You make a commitment. The commitment is that you will be faithful. You will be living in holiness every day of your life until the day you no longer live or our king returns for his bride. Perhaps, brother or sister, you have not lived up to those standards. Perhaps you're trying to ruin the peace for everyone by making ungodly choices. And you're being ungrateful, you're being greedy by the sinful choices that you are choosing to continue in. You see, Christ has given you prosperity in God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 tells us that God is rich in mercy. Why do you want to mess that prosperity, spiritually speaking, up? Tonight, you can make your situation right with the king. We can advocate on your behalf through prayer. And 1 John chapter 2, verse 9 tells us that Christ is himself is already advocating on your behalf to his Father. But you have to be willing to repent. And you have to be willing to restore. So that you can once again enjoy the peace with God and the prosperity that comes with it. If you are subject to this invitation tonight, we lovingly encourage you to come forward as we stand and we sing.